Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our 22nd lecture uh, in the series of uh, philosophy of science in economics. Uh, if you recall, uh, for the last uh, few months, we have been discussing issues that uh, relate to philosophy of science. And um, in our last lecture, uh, which was uh, lecture 21, uh, we discussed uh, uh, the classical uh, theories of truth. And uh, if you recall, uh, one of the fundamental questions uh, in the philosophy of science uh, is the question of knowledge. Uh, and of course, knowledge is uh, defined as the uh, justified true beliefs. Uh, so we did discuss uh, issues of uh, beliefs, uh, the issue of uh, uh, justification and the issue of truth. So we now understand exactly what constitutes um, knowledge. And uh, I know that later on um, uh, in our free time, we may be able to go through the Gettier problem uh, that uh, challenges uh, that very uh, understanding uh, of the theory of knowledge. Uh, of course, uh, uh, that is epistemology. So in uh, philosophy of science, we deal with the issues of uh, uh, epistemology, uh, issues of uh, ontology, uh, then issues of metaphysics, uh, issues of axiology. And uh, we attempt to link that to issues of uh, methodology and methods, ladies and gentlemen. So you know, as 22nd lecture, I want to take you through a philosophical tale of two research cultures, and that is really uh, quantitative and qualitative, but more so uh, uh, going into or delving into issues that relate to the philosophy of science, ladies and gentlemen. So I want to welcome you uh, because um, I know that you've been very busy for quite some time now, but um, uh, despite uh, your busy schedule, uh, at least you have decided to uh, create time uh, to be able to go through these aspects of um, uh, the philosophy of science. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, if you recall, I did say that um, uh, issues of uh, uh, philosophy of science, uh, of course, are linked to issues of methodology uh, and issues of axiology and methods. Uh, so I, let me attempt to demonstrate to you a link between these aspects, and then later on, uh, we shall be discussing other things. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the quantitative and uh, uh, qualitative uh, uh, research traditions that can be thought of as distinct cultures uh, marked by uh, different values. And uh, when we talk about values, we bring in the issue of axiology. Uh, so marked by different values, uh, different beliefs, and different norms. And quite often, you'll find people fighting uh, over this uh, uh, concept or aspect uh, of qualitative and quantitative. There are those who do not want to hear anything about qualitative. And the only thing that they know is actually quantitative. And there are those who don't want to hear uh, anything about uh, qualitative or quantitative. And the only thing they know is about qualitative. And there are those who attempt to uh, look at uh, uh, these two uh, aspects, qualitative and quantitative, as, um, uh, uh, as uh, research traditions that uh, do uh, reinforce each other. So in other words, at one stage, uh, you may take on the quantitative aspect, and another time, you take on the qualitative. So taking the mixed kind of uh, uh, mixed methods uh, perspective. Uh, so as, you, as I've already told you, the quantitative and qualitative are research traditions, certainly that can be thought of as distinct cultures marked by different values, different beliefs, and different norms, ladies and gentlemen. So when we talk about different values or differing values, we are actually talking about axiology. And axiology is one of the uh, major philosophical perspective. And uh, you actually have a field uh, called axiological uh, philosophy. Um, but I will not really go into the details of that. But uh, as you can see here, axiology is the theory of value. Uh, of theory of worth, right? 
And uh, archaeology attempts to ask the question uh, and uh, what is good and what is bad. And sometimes it even goes into issues of ethics in this perspective, as you can see. So axiology is made up of two subparts, and uh, you will have certainly ethics, and you have aesthetics. Now, with the ethics, uh, we are dealing with the, uh, we are dealing with the theories uh, that uh, uh, give us the goodness or badness of human behavior. And aesthetics uh, is the theory uh, of the goodness or badness of visual appearance or audible sound expressed in terms of beauty or ugliness, ladies and gentlemen. So these are very important aspects that uh, should not really be ignored. So when we define uh, quantitative and qualitative in terms of research uh, traditions that uh, can be thought of as having distinct cultures marked by differing or different axiology, then certainly those are the aspects that we are dealing with. So different uh, ethics, uh, different aesthetics, and asking questions uh, that lead to what is good and what is bad, and attempting to answer those questions, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, in this case, we can see that idealistic axiology, uh, what we may call idealistic ethics, uh, will deal with the uh, goodness, and uh, in this case, goodness is found in the ideal uh, that is in perfection and is uh, found on the immaterial level uh, that is in the perfect concept or notion or idea of something. And uh, you know, we've been dealing with the constructions, we've been dealing with the reality and abstracting reality out there using concepts and uh, using constructs. And those are the aspects we've been really uh, trying to discuss in the last uh, few months, ladies and gentlemen. So, as you can see, that's what it is. But uh, the moment we start talking about uh, idealistic axiology, then we venture into questions like uh, uh, can somebody tell the truth uh, most of the time? And uh, if you are undertaking research, is it possible for you to really undertake research and discover the truth uh, with the, what we call uh, minimal biases? So can we try to get rid of our biases? So in this case, uh, truth uh, is the knowledge of ideal reality, and that's why we deal with uh, a perfect concept or a notion. For example, always tell the truth, uh, or uh, if we put it negatively, never tell a lie, uh, since truth is the knowledge of ideal reality, and those are the aspects we've been discussing in our lecture 21, lecture 20, lecture 19. Uh, and so forth. And therefore, truth becomes very important. Uh, truth uh, is the knowledge of ideal reality, and the lie is distortion of that reality. So what we want is really uh, the ability to capture reality out there and get the truth out of it. So truth must always be told, and lying can never be justified. Ladies and gentlemen, remember knowledge is justified true beliefs. So you cannot justify a lie, right? So in idealistic axiology, as we have already seen, ladies and gentlemen, we also deal with the idealistic ethics. And uh, the idealist is not over interested in specific or concrete instances, uh, since reality is in the general idea of something and less in a particular representation of the idea, ladies and gentlemen. So idealistic uh, axiology uh, certainly deals with that aspect that I've already told you, and um, we can't even give uh, examples uh, for our case uh, to bring this point home. So, as you can see, an, an idealist painter, idealist painter, for example, will therefore try to paint the perfect person. You know that very well. So the person who has that um, uh, aspect that you may call idealism, and you want to call that fellow idealist, idealist painter, 
he will try to really capture the object the way it is. So uh, the fellow tries, for instance, to paint a perfect person or to bring out the person's inner identity. But of course, if you recall uh, from our previous discussions, I did tell you that reality can be complex, right? Reality can be dynamic. So capturing that kind of uh, information is not very easy, right? Now, but um, we are taking this example of uh, a painter, and I hope you pick the point and you understand the point. Now, if the if the person in the painting uh, had cut herself or himself and had a scar on uh, his or her face, now the painter will leave the scar out, or at least uh, idealize it. You remember our lectures on idealization, de-idealization, right? And uh, of course, uh, that debate between idealization and de-idealization and the modeling bit of it. And you recall when we looked at modeling and the caricatures, and those are the things that we discussed. So this, the painter who is looking for an ideal person will leave these things out, and gentlemen. And again, that will bring out a challenge uh, that uh, we need to understand because reality will not be captured the way it should be captured. But, yeah. but all the same, uh, this uh, uh, painter here can be taken to be an idealist uh, painter in this perspective, ladies and gentlemen. So that's why I'm saying uh, in this perspective that uh, when we deal with the issues of philosophy, yes, we deal with ontology, we deal with epistemology, but we do not leave axiology out. Uh, axiology are major issues uh, that need to be discussed as we are discussing today and they will certainly lead into uh, what we call methodology and of course methods and those are the things I'm going to really discuss uh, in this lecture ladies and gentlemen so as you can see uh, axiology is the foundation for all of your conscious judgments and decisions and therefore the basis for all uh, positive thoughts and action of course related to the activities uh, or the designed activities in, in this case so any action uh, based uh, on even the most casual reflection has its foundation in your standards of what is good uh, what is bad or what is right and what is wrong ladies and gentlemen so I want to show you a diagram and I'm sure you can see that diagram on the screen here Right, and uh, uh, that is how we move, uh, especially in, uh, in research, especially in the growing understanding of knowledge in a number of disciplines. Uh, so we begin with ontology. I'm sure you can see this on the screen here. Uh, we have ontology, uh, and um, uh, ontology deals with reality. What is reality? Right, and uh, remember issues that relate to axiology again may uh, somehow uh, impinge or affect uh, issues that relate to uh, our research uh, in general uh, or our understanding and extraction of knowledge. So, ontology uh, that's where we begin, and that is really reality. We want to understand that very well. Uh, so, the ontology or ontological perspectives will certainly lead to epistemology, as you can see on the screen here. And uh, with the epistemology, we attempt to answer issues of what and how can I know reality, really. So, the reality exists out there, independent of the researcher, but then you are interested in knowing that reality. Right, and you are interested in generating knowledge, really, issues of knowing, and that's epistemology. Now, that, again, epistemology will lead to theoretical perspective. And um, when you go to the theoretical perspective, then issues of what approach uh, can we use to get that knowledge, and those are the issues that come in there. Right, uh, uh, what is the most appropriate? Because there are so many approaches, but we are interested in the most appropriate approach. And then, a theoretical perspective will lead you to what we call methodology. Uh, what procedure can we use to acquire that knowledge? So, the moment we go to methodology from the theoretical perspective, we go to method. Remember, uh, 
the theories that, or the theoretical backing or perspectives that we undertake will help you to explain reality out there and uh, develop uh, knowledge that you want to develop. Right, but at the end of the day, uh, you need uh, certainly to, uh, to acquire that knowledge. So that's where we go into methodology. What procedure can we use to acquire knowledge? And then from there we go to methods, right? What tools can we use to acquire that knowledge? So methods certainly deals with the tools uh, that you can use, ladies and gentlemen, to acquire that knowledge. And that takes us to the sources. Uh, what data can we collect, ladies and gentlemen? So as you can see, those things are very important. And uh, right now, uh, since we've been dealing with the philosophy of science, uh, what I want to do uh, is to try and uh, demonstrate to you the link between the paradigms we have in research. Uh, no, in actually in, um, in the philosophy of science, right, and uh, research in general, and certainly uh, the various um, uh, philosophical perspectives. So I've already told you in the philosophical perspective, we've got ontology, uh, of course, what is reality? We've got epistemology, uh, how can I know reality? Then we have the theoretical perspective, uh, and there you are dealing with the approach uh, that you want to use to, uh, to know something, methodology, how do you uh, how do you go about really finding uh, out what is happening and methods, uh, what techniques uh, can you use to find out? So those are the uh, philosophical perspectives. But um, again, I, I just want to show you on the diagram here, on the screen, and I'm sure you can see that screen here, that uh, uh, you have that uh, in form of the uh, what we call columns. Yes, the first column is for ontology, the second column is for epistemology, the another column is for theoretical perspective, and then of course you've got the methodology, and then the last column which is for methods. Now, in terms of rows, uh, the first row is for positivism, uh, the second row is for constructivist, or what you call the interpretive perspective and the next row is for pragmatism and of course the uh, next row is for subjectivism and then the last row is for critical realism and uh, these are the things that you, you will be finding uh, especially when you are undertaking your research at the PhD level and there's no way you can actually ignore uh, this aspect here. Now when we look at ontology and positivism uh, that particular uh, area of intersection uh, in our diagram, uh, this kind of uh, idea that comes out here is that uh, there is a single reality uh, or a truth. So when you talk about truth, there is a single truth. Out there, there's a single reality, right? So the moment you talk about a single reality, and a single truth that can be discovered, and then you are talking about uh, having a more realist perspective, and that is really positivism related to ontology. Now, the moment we go to the constructivist or the interpretive and uh, ontology, uh, of course, in this kind of thinking, there is no single reality or truth and uh, reality here is created by individuals uh, uh, in groups and these fellows are less realist in this kind of uh, thinking as you can see and that's why they have the constructivist or the interpretive uh, so a constructivist that means knowledge is constructed but there is no single reality there is no single truth so you can actually have um, uh, many uh, truths and many realities depending on the lenses that individuals have and the perspectives that the individuals will have. Now, at the same time, you are dealing with the ontology and pragmatism, then you must answer fundamental question uh, of reality, right? So uh, that means that uh, reality is constantly renegotiated, right, and debated and uh, interpreted uh, in light of uh, its usefulness 
uh, in new unpredictable uh, situations. So that's why you have the pragmatist and ontology. Reality is constantly negotiated. That's why you have the pragmatic perspective. So uh, yes, reality may exist somewhere, but constantly negotiated because reality is very complex. Reality is very dynamic, right? So we constantly debate that reality and come up with interpretations that led to that. Now, at the same time here, uh, if you let's go to the subjectivism and also look at the ontological perspective. So if you are dealing with the subjectivism, that means reality is what we perceive uh, to be real. And uh, if you recall, uh, borrowing from the words of Einstein, I told you that reality can be an illusion, albeit a persistent one, ladies and gentlemen. And I gave you an example of, let's say, a layer uh, line, uh, especially if you are at this point, you may actually see as if uh, those two are meeting, or probably if you are talking about two lines and you are here, then um, uh, the fellows who is the other side, if you are standing here and you are looking afar, you may actually see as if these two uh, lines uh, are somehow converging or probably meeting uh, when they actually sense they are parallel and they are not meeting at all. I gave you so many examples. If you remember walking on a sunny day, right, seeing a mirage, you may think it is real, but in the actual sense, not real. If you put a stick on top of a lake, or river or somewhere on top of water, you actually see that stick as if it is bent and uh, that is not what it is but that's what you are seeing. So the subjectivist uh, individuals believe that reality is what we perceive uh, to be real. Now on the other side, if you still look at the ontology and you are dealing with the critical uh, realism, so realities uh, are socially constructed entities that are under constant internal uh, influence, ladies and gentlemen. So those are the things that you will have. Yes, critical realism, uh, uh, reality is taken to be socially uh, constructed, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So that is on the side of ontology. And since we have been discussing these issues for quite some time now, I do not really want to spend a lot of time other than just summarizing. And very soon I'll be coming to the close uh, of this, uh, uh, of, of our series of lectures in the philosophy of science, ladies and gentlemen. So, but let's look at our, uh, look at, uh, epistemology, right, and also try to uh, compare epistemology with the various paradigms, uh, positivism, constructivism, and so forth. Remember I've told you that epistemology deals with the uh, knowledge, really. How can I know reality out there, right? And uh, under positivism, there's a general thinking here that uh, reality can be measured and hence uh, the focus is on reliable and valid tools uh, to obtain that. So the thinking is that reality is objective and that you can always measure that reality. So we want to have those particular tools uh, that will help us achieve that. That's in the positivistic kind of thinking. In the constructi constructivist or the interpretive perspective, uh, and still dealing with knowledge here, uh, reality needs to be interpreted, right? And that's the thinking. And uh, it is used to discover the underlying meaning of events and activities out there. So that's why you're talking about the constructivist or the interpretive uh, perspective. And again, when we go to the pragmatism and epistemology, the best method is uh, one that solves the problems and uh, finding out is the means and change is the underlying aim. And that's what you have under pragmatism uh, and subjectivism. Uh, you are saying all knowledge is purely a matter of perspective and under critical realism, you are simply saying reality and knowledge is both socially constructed and influenced by power relations uh, within a particular society or particular community. So that is really in as far as epistemology is concerned and the various paradigms in research. And you remember we are talking about paradigm wars, right, in research. 
and uh, therefore we need to understand the various um, uh, ideas and perspectives that individuals hold. Now when we go to the theoretical perspective and again letting the theoretical perspective with the paradigms right, uh, in a theoretical perspective we deal with the, uh, the approach uh, that we want to use to know something. Now under positivism, of course, uh, as I've already told you, models do exist and uh, therefore you can pick any one of them and you'll be able to pick this information. So the theoretical perspective here will be positivism and uh, the post-positivism. Uh, now under the constructivist or the interpretive perspective, uh, of course, uh, here uh, there's a general thinking that reality needs to be interpreted and therefore uh, we use aspects of phenomenology, right? Issues of symbolic interactions, uh, issues of hermeneutics, right, are very important. And therefore, uh, critical inquiry, feminism, uh, can also be very useful in this thinking. Now, when you move down to another paradigm that we call pragmatism, as you can see on the on the on on the screen. Then in terms of theoretical perspective, we take the uh, Dewey and pragmatism research uh, uh, through design, and that's what is used. And at the subjectivism, we go to postmodernism, uh, structuralism, and post-structuralism, ladies and gentlemen. And while the critical realism will take them maximism, a queer theory, and feminism, ladies and gentlemen. So let's now relate the paradigms and the methodology how do you go about finding out under the positivism uh, then um, the methodology you use will certainly be experimental research and survey research under the constructivist and the interpretive uh, you'll find uh, ethnography uh, grounded theory uh, phenomenological research ladies and gentlemen heuristic inquiry action research, uh, discourse analysis, uh, feminist standpoint research, etc, etc. The list is quite long, uh, but I'll just give those ones in the interest of time. And under pragmatism, which is a paradigm, uh, the methodology you choose would be mixed methods design, uh, uh, best research, right? So mixed methods uh, is uh, one of the methodology uh, which is really uh, taken up by the pragmatist in this perspective. So they will tell you that whenever we really feel that uh, we need to mix, we just mix. But again, the issue of mixing is very important here because you need to know whether uh, the mixing will be 50-50, 50, 50, 50 qualitative, 50 quantitative, or 20-80, 20, uh, 20 qualitative and 80 uh, quantitative. And vice versa, you can always uh, go on changing the percentages and then of course at the end of the day you must understand the implications of that, your research, ladies and gentlemen. So it's important that uh, we really get to know what the pragmatists do in this perspective. Now under subjectivism, then uh, the methodology that is uh, adopted is discourse theory. Uh, then you can also undertake archaeology, genealogy, and deconstruction, uh, plus a number of other approaches. Under critical realism, uh, critical, the methodology adopted again is critical discourse analysis. Uh, you may have uh, critical ethnography, uh, action research, ideology, uh, critique, and so forth. So. That's what it is. Now that's the methodology. Let's now go to the methods and try to relate the methods and the paradigms, ladies and gentlemen. So as I've already said, under method, your concern is um, on the techniques. Uh, what techniques uh, do you use to find out right, what's happening? So under the uh, positivistic uh, kind of thinking, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we usually uh, um, adopt the quantitative, right? And uh, of course, uh, to include issues of sampling, uh, measurements, uh, issues of scaling, uh, issues of statistical analysis, uh, you use the questionnaires, uh, focus group interviews, uh, ATC. Now these are the methods that you are going to use at the end of the day, uh, ladies and gentlemen, under the positivistic approach. Now under the constructivist approach, or interpretive in this case, 
Uh, qualitative uh, can also be used uh, to include the qualitative interview. You can use observations, uh, uh, called participant observation, uh, non-participant observations. Then you can have uh, case studies. Uh, you can have life history, you can have narratives, uh, uh, and then the theme identifications and so forth. That is now the contract, uh, contra constructivist perspective. Now another paradigm that we call the pragmatism, in this case, the method, uh, of course we say, uh, we talked about mixed method in this case, so a combination of any of the above, uh, the above in terms of the ones I've already given you for qualitative where you have the questionnaire and then you've got the case study and then you've got um, uh, life history the, then you have uh, qualitative interviews uh, etc. So a combination of these can actually work in this perspective and uh, of course at the end of the day you are interested in data mining you can also do that expert review uh, usability uh, testing uh, physical prototype uh, plus a number of other things ladies and gentlemen that is the pragmatism where you have a combination of both qualitative and quantitative so under subjectivism ladies and gentlemen in terms of the methods then we use ultra uh, ethnography uh, the semiotics, you can use literature analysis, uh, then you can use the pastiche, uh, intertextually, uh, extra and extra. There are so many things that you can do in this case. And the critical realism, in terms of methodology, you can have uh, ideological review, the civil actions, open-ended interviews, focus group discussions, open-ended questionnaires, open-ended observations, and journals, ladies and gentlemen. So those are the things that you will have. Since we are dealing with the paradigm wars, right, and um, you need to understand uh, how the philosopher of science lists the various paradigms that we adopt, the positivism, uh, the constructivist uh, perspective, uh, the pragmatist uh, perspective or thinking, and the subjectivism and the critical uh, uh, analysis, ladies and gentlemen. Critical realism uh, is one of the things that uh, most researchers have adopted over the years, ladies and gentlemen. So, again, most of these things that I've been talking about are related to the theory of knowledge, uh, which we did discuss some time back. And uh, I did tell you that uh, uh, a, a long time ago, uh, and some time ago, uh, many years ago actually, uh, Socrates made a statement, right? Uh, 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 Socrates said many years ago that the unexplained life is not worth living. So why do you live a life that is not really explained, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah? So the theory of knowledge uh, is about the examination of the world around us. And it's very important for us to examine that world around us. and. Um, uh, we ask ourselves a number of questions. Um, what makes up the things we think of as knowledge, right? And uh, when we know something, how do we know that uh, it is even really true? And those are the previous lectures that we've been uh, going through. Uh, lecture 21, lecture 20, lecture 19, lecture 18. Issues of knowledge. And it helps us examine our lives and help us to be critical of knowledge claims uh, which are not actually knowledge but instead only beliefs, opinions, propaganda and sometimes deceit. So knowledge claims ladies and gentlemen are claims made by someone when they say they know something. The world we know is made uh, completely, made up completely of knowledge claims. Right? People will be telling you a number of things. This is what is uh, this is this is what is happening. This is very true. This is what it is. All those are knowledge claims because knowledge is justified through belief. So we must be able to justify those beliefs. First of all, understand the beliefs very well. We must be able to provide evidence to justify that and facts. And then truth becomes an essential part of that. And I gave you a number of theories uh, that uh, explain truth 
But at the end of the day, I think we, especially after interrogating each one of them, you saw the weaknesses associated with those uh, truth theories, ladies and gentlemen. So again, we need to answer those questions. How do we know uh, uh, that uh, these knowledge claims are representative of reality out there? So that's why we actually say that uh, this is really, uh, or these are knowledge claims and not facts of knowledge. So do not misunderstand us when we talk about theory of knowledge, right? A theory of knowledge is just that we are dealing with the knowledge claims, right? But not facts of knowledge. Uh, there is not one answer to questions regarding knowledge uh, and uh, of course, countless theories about what knowledge actually is, uh, the nature of knowledge and so forth have been put forward, right? But we just need to understand these things very well. I will not really go into uh, those uh, aspects uh, of knowledge uh, claims and what knowledge is in terms of justified true beliefs and uh, attempting to uh, certainly prove that, but uh, certainly the moment you come up with a proposition of knowledge or proposition, then that means you believe in that proposition and uh, you have sound reasons for believing that proposition and therefore you must provide justification and uh, especially if you have no evidence that negates or erodes uh, your belief in P, then that will be taken to be uh, the correct kind of thing uh, that you uh, you will be able to uh, pass on to others, especially who are very critical and are very very weighty of the statements that are made by others. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we are dealing with paradigm wars again, as we saw uh, in the in the in the research tradition. Uh, we see uh, that quantitative and qualitative research traditions. Uh, each research tradition is sometimes uh, privately suspicious or, or skeptical of the other, uh, though usually more uh, publicly polite. So in public, yes, they are very, very, a, 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 a person who believes in a quantitative will be a little bit polite, but he's very suspicious uh, of the other fellows in the qualitative. And the reverse is true. So communication across uh, traditions tend to be difficult and uh, marked by misunderstandings. So uh, usually when the members uh, of one tradition offer their insights uh, to members of the other community, uh, the advice is likely to be viewed rightly or wrongly as unhelpful and even belittling, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, this sparks of what we call paradigm wars. Uh, and uh, uh, you will have the quant qualitative and the quantitative divide. Uh, but remember, we've talked about the various paradigms, uh, of course, where you have the constructivists. I hope you still remember those ones. You've got the pragmatists, etc. There are those who believe that you can actually mix. But those who are on the extreme, certainly will be suspicious of each other and of course triggering what we call uh, paradigm wars, sparking of paradigm wars. Uh, that's the qualitative and the quantitative divide, right? Now the struggle for, pri uh, for primacy of one para uh, paradigm over the other uh, refers to the debates uh, surrounding research paradigms, uh, which were particularly active in the 1980s, ladies and gentlemen. So at one end of the debate are the purists who assert paradigms and methods should not be mixed. Now, of course, and another school of thought is identified as the situationalists, uh, who contend that certain methods uh, can be used in specific situations. Now, in direct opposition to the purists are the pragmatists, ladies and gentlemen, who argued against a false dichotomy between the qualitative and quantitative research paradigms. And they do advocate uh, for the efficient use of both approaches. And I've just taken you through uh, the pragmatist uh, uh, perspective or paradigm. Now, of course, proponents of mixed methods research uh, have been uh, uh, linked to those who identify with the pragmatic uh, paradigm, as you can see there. 
And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just to remind you a little bit, uh, historically, uh, the, these fellows, the pragmatists, uh, can be traced to an early period uh, from 1860s and 1930s, and the New York pragmatic era from 1960 uh, to present. And um, many mixed methods, uh, researchers and theorists draw strong associations uh, with the mixed methodology and pragmatism. And if you want to really find uh, out this, what the scholars have been saying, you have to read the works of Data 1997, Basel 2003, then you have others like Tasha Corey and Ted Line, uh, Ted Line in 2003, and then uh, Johnson and Don Gabuzi in 2004, plus many other scholars, ladies and gentlemen. So the perspective of pragmatism uh, asserts that something is knowledge if and only if uh, the proposed, uh, proposed bit of knowledge works in real life settings, and that's why they actually move. Uh, between the positivistic and uh, uh, the anti-positivistic uh, endpoints. And uh, of course, uh, the belief for these pragmatists is that we do not know anything until we see that it works. So knowledge in this case is power, and it must allow us to do something. In other words, when you go out to understand reality, right out there and you study, you must be able to understand that reality and be able to do something to that reality, ladies and gentlemen. So, as you can see in this kind of debate, uh, the scientific knowledge uh, is actually pragmatic knowledge in this case. And uh, that's what the pragmatism believe. Uh, if a scientist can, cannot show that uh, her hypothesis or his hypothesis works, then his hypothesis or her uh, hypothesis is disregarded in this perspective. So people such as engineers in this kind of uh, uh, debate, mechanics and pilots, all know their professions when they can do what they are supposed to do. And that's what happens. Yes, we create knowledge. But if I'm an engineer or a pilot, right, that knowledge must help me navigate, uh, uh, of course, uh, up there and be able to move and do something. So if you're an engineer, you must be able, a civil engineer, for instance, must help you in the construction business. And uh, if you are a mechanical engineer, it must help you do something in your area too. And that's what we call the pragmat, uh, pragmatist uh, knowledge. So according to the pragmatist, ladies and gentlemen, we have knowledge when it allows us to successfully navigate through our environment. And uh, in this case, we become certain of something only when we first know it, uh, when it works. Certainly, uh, 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 working becomes an important element here, and certainty is an outcome of knowledge, not a basis for it, ladies and gentlemen. So how do we then uh, choose a research paradigm, right? Because I know very soon you will be concerned with paradigms and you you'll have to choose research paradigms. So research paradigms uh, which you choose, ladies and gentlemen, will depend on your research questions, right? And will depend on the underlying philosophies of social science and the long held and much cherished tenets about epistemology. And uh, the effect of the social context and the, uh, the effect of the social context on the interplay between epistemological position and methodological decision becomes very essential in this case. And of course, the other decision that you're going to base on is uh, for you to understand uh, what other social scientists are doing uh, to fashions in both method methodology and the topic, and of course your preference and skills as a researcher, ladies and gentlemen. So we continue with our debate on how to choose a research paradigm. Remember we've been talking about paradigms? And the paradigm was which seemed to exist. Now, of course, the other uh, decision that you can base on is the funding, research funding, and uh, uh, publishing opportunities. Uh, if you go to the various journal articles uh, or go to the various journals where you want to publish, you will see the kind of 
paradigms that uh, these fellows are, 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 are promoting. And therefore, uh, you can actually uh, choose your paradigm on the basis of what will be taken up by that particular journal. And of course, the funders of your research will also dictate on what you should be doing. Now, of course, the others would be in terms of the intra-professional rivalries and uh, differences, and even by politics, uh, and uh, this politics uh, in terms of power relations between the academics and those who take part in research. All of these will certainly influence, right? Uh, how you are, what kind of paradigm you will take up, how others construct their work. Uh, in short, it is a very complicated business, ladies and gentlemen, choosing a research paradigm, but you'll be influenced by a number of issues in this perspective. So, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, uh, we can now look at the basic principles of research design. And, uh, and uh, here we see four main features of research design, ladies and gentlemen, which are distinct but closely related. And uh, that's why when you are undertaking a study uh, at this level, doctoral level, these things must be thought about. So these four main features are ontology, uh, how you, the researcher, view the world and the assumptions that you make about the nature of the world and of reality, right? And this is part of your research design. You must articulate, right? How you view that world, how you view reality, and your assumptions about reality. Then the second aspect is that of epistemology, the assumptions that you make about the best way of investigating the world and about reality, right? So if you're going to investigate the world, right, and be able to pick that uh, information and craft it into something that is called knowledge, then that becomes a real thing. So epistemology uh, will be uh, one of the main features of your research design. The third one is methodology, and uh, that's the way that you group together your research techniques to make a coherent picture. And luckily enough, in your methodology, you always have that section of ethics. So you'll be dealing with axiology, right? Uh, and that is really the value of your research. You want to minimize biases uh, in your research. And in addition to that section of ethics, you will have another uh, section uh, for common methods biases, ladies and gentlemen. So in such a perspective, you are dealing with the axiology at the same time. So ontology, epistemology, and axiology comes in there in the methodology and so forth. And then, of course, lastly, you've got the methods and techniques, what you actually do in order to collect your data and carry out your investigations. So as you can see, these principles that I've just given you uh, will inform which methods you choose. You need to understand how they fit with your bigger picture of the world and how you choose to investigate it to ensure that your work will be coherent and effective, ladies and gentlemen. Now, of course, what I want to do now is to give you what I call schools of ontology so that you understand that the ontology is not really uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, simple, but it has so many other aspects that you must think about in your research. And of course, when you do with the ontology, we are concerned with the reality out there. So how do we construct uh, reality? And uh, I'm going to show that here on the screen, and I hope you'll be able to see that. On the screen here, I show four main schools of ontology, and here the issue is about how we construct reality out there. Now, uh, in the way of constructing reality, we use about four major aspects. Uh, we have realism, uh, then we have internal realism, we have relativism, and we have nominalism. And those are the, really the schools uh, right, of ontology. And then, of course, on this other side, the rows, as you can see, I'll give you a summary about these aspects. I'll also say something about truth and also say something about facts. The reason why I have uh, truth and facts there, because I would have given you only the summary, is because when we start dealing with knowledge, uh, we deal with justified 
true beliefs. So the issue of truth cannot be ignored, ladies and gentlemen. So under realism, right, I'll give you a summary of realism. And here the world, uh, right, is real, right? And this is the kind of thinking. The world is real and science proceeds by examining and observing it. So the world is real the way it is in a serious setting, right? So we go out, right, and we take on scientific tools and methods of examining that particular uh, reality out there or that particular world. Because the world is real, so reality uh, can be examined scientifically uh, and we can observe it. So under realism, right, let's talk about the element of truth, right? Here, the belief that there is a single truth, right, and can be discovered and can be verified. If you are using the coherence theory, you know exactly what you do, coherence, coherence theory of, of truth, right? Uh, of course, uh, if you are using other theories, right, like this, the, the identity theory of truth, then the situation will be totally different, uh, different. If you are using the coherence theory, the situation is also a little bit different, ladies and gentlemen. So in terms of facts, right, and uh, realism, facts exist, right, that's the belief, and can be revealed through experiments. So you can carry out experiments, right, and then you'll be able to discover those facts, right. That is realism. Let's also go into, in, into internal realism. Right, for internal realism, the situation is like this, right? In the summary, again, as you can see, the world is real, but it is almost impossible to examine it directly, right? It's real, but very difficult, right? And that is really the summary of internal realism. And of course, in terms of truth, here, yeah, truth exists, but is obscure, right? So you are dealing with obscurity of truth. Obscure truth is there, but truth is obscure. In terms of facts, facts are concrete, but cannot always be revealed. And that's what you have under internal realism. Now for relativism, right, the summary I will give you is that scientific laws are basically created by people to fit their view of reality. And that's why we're talking about relativism. So knowledge is relative, reality is relative out there. In terms of truth, there are many truths Right, and if you remember the theories we've been looking at, those are the questions we've been interrogating and trying to answer under our lecture 21, lecture 20 and 19. You can go back and try to find out what we discussed. And then, of course, um, under facts, uh, facts depend on the viewpoint of the observer, ladies and gentlemen. So under nominalism now, which is another school of ontology, reality is entirely created by people, and there is no external truth. That is the belief, that's a general summary uh, for the nominalism. And in terms of truth, uh, the, there's a belief here that there is no truth, right? That's under the fourth school of ontology of nominalism. And then in terms of facts, right? Uh, there's a belief here that facts are all human creations, right? So. Uh, they don't believe in the existence of facts, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see, uh, none of these positions that I've given you, realism, internal realism, relativism, and nominalism, none of those positions are absolutes, ladies and gentlemen. They are on a continuum with the overlaps between them. So once in a while you can move from one area to another area, ladies and gentlemen. So let's now look at epistemological issues. That is the way in which you choose to investigate the world, right? We continue with those epistemological issues. Now, two main schools are positivism and social constructivism. And of course here, the positivistic uh, people believe that the best way to investigate the world is through objective methods, such as observations. And of course here, positivism fits within a realist ontology. Now we also have social constructivism. Uh, they believe that reality does not exist by itself, and uh, instead it is constructed and given meaning by people. So their focus is therefore on feelings, right? Focus is on beliefs and thoughts, 
and how people communicate these. So social constructivism, constructionism fits better with a relativist ontology, ladies and gentlemen. So we can actually talk about those aspects. So and epistemological issues, again, as I said earlier on, uh, we are confronted with the questions, what is knowledge, uh, what is knowing, uh, what is the basis uh, for knowledge, and what is the, the, the difference between knowledge and faith, right? Uh, is certainty possible, ladies and gentlemen? Now, of course, I can always say this, that uh, your epistemology, what you believe about knowledge, affects what you accept as valid evidence and therefore what you are willing to believe about particulars, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So, briefly, we'll go into methods and then uh, maybe if time allows, I hope I've, I've not really exceeded uh, the time, but uh, let me just give you something about methodology. Ontology and epistemology will have implications uh, for your methodology, ladies and gentlemen. So, as we saw, the realists tend to have a positivist approach. So they tend to gather quantitative sources of data, while the relativists tend to have a social construct, constructionist uh, approach. So they tend to gather qualitative sources of data. Uh, remember, these are not absolutes, as I've already told you. Uh, people tend to work on a continuum, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, if they are working on the on a continuum, they tend to uh, to, to value the role uh, of mixed uh, approaches or mixed methods. And uh, in this case, we also consider the roles of the researcher. So we deal with the issues of internal and external, uh, and of course, whether you are actually very much involved in your research or not, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, what I want to do now is. Uh, for us to close our discussions, uh, because this lecture should not last uh, longer than one hour or more than one hour. But um, as you can see when we talk about the world view and research paradigms, uh, the quantitative and qualitative research traditions, uh, again, as I said, can be thought of as distinctive cultures marked by different values. You know that very well. Uh, but everybody in this case has a world view and given its importance researchers need to be mindful of the fact that all people act and live in certain ways because they are guided by particular world views. So our, our view or views about reality will certainly guide us the way we do things, ladies and gentlemen. So in the simplest uh, terms, a world view may be defined as how one sees life and the world at large. And in this manner, it can be compared to a pair of glasses. Uh, the interpretive lens helps people make sense of life and comprehend the world around them. And of course, uh, sometimes the lens uh, brings some kind of clarity and other times it can distort reality. So we all have lenses that we use to examine reality out there, ladies and gentlemen. So the word worldview refers to the cluster of beliefs a person holds about the most significant concept of life, such as God, the cosmos, uh, knowledge, uh, values, humanity, and history. And uh, this, these beliefs that I've talked about, which may in reality be right or wrong or a combination thereof, not unlike the visual clarity or distortion given by glasses, form a big picture or a general outlook or a grand perspective of life, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So in closing, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you recall that um, uh, our lecture today centered around uh, that major question that people have always asked as to whether it is possible to combine qualitative and quantitative. But more so, I've attempted to give you the philosophical tell uh, of those two research cultures, uh, the qualitative and quantitative. So I've 
managed to bring in the element of philosophy and tie up the loose ends uh, of, of philosophy and then paradigm because we have paradigm wars and I've given you the various paradigms and you know what paradigms are ladies and gentlemen so I want to thank you uh, for attending this lecture 22nd in the series uh, of or, uh, actually our lecture series in the philosophy of science uh, in economics ladies and gentlemen and remember those are the questions that we've been struggling with uh, for quite some time, questions of reality out there. So I want to thank you and uh, I'll be closing uh, lectures uh, in this series very soon. Uh, possibly uh, our next lecture will be the last one uh, and then uh, uh, but I must really thank you for uh, having been with us for a very long time uh, going through all these marathon lectures on the philosophy of science and economics. But stay well, uh, stay safe. I wish you a nice time. Enjoy your life and I wish you to, I wish you really a nice day and happiness. Thank you. Bye.